أيها الحضور الأعزاء سنذهب وإياكم إلى المتحدث الرسمي الرابع الأستاذ الدكتور جميل سلمي أستاذ دكتور في اقتصاديات التعليم بالمعهد الوطني للتخطيط التعليمي فرنسا والحديث في الجلسة الرابعة عن التحول الرقمي وضمان الجودة في التعليم العالي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وأسعد الله صباح الجميع بكل خير وأستميحكم عذرا بالحديث باللغة الإنجليزية وستوجد ترجمة بإذن الله So good morning everyone and I would like to welcome all of you to this keynote speech entitled what digital transformation means for quality assurance. And I hope that always it is difficult to start a session after a short break. But I hope that the advantage of that want to have at least energy to come back and attending the session. So as I said, the, the title will be what digital transformation means for quality assurance. And our speaker, for this session is Professor Jamil Salmi. And allow me to give a short bio. So I will not read details because he has a long bio, bio but I will be highlighting the main. So Professor Jamil Salmi is a global tertiary education expert providing policy advice to governments, institutions, as well as development agencies. He was, until January 2012, he was the World Bank's tertiary education coordinator. Professor Jamil is an emeritus professor of higher education, policy at Diego Bortales University in Chile, and research fellow at Boston College Center for Higher Education. His latest book on tertiary education and the sustainable development goals was published in 2017. In 2020, he wrote a report on the impact of COVID in higher education through the equity lens for the Lomina Foundation. His next book, in fact, this morning he informed me that two days back, it's already published, which is uh, a book co-edited with Professor Philip Albach and Maria Yudfetic to be published, uh, as he said, uh, but already right now uh, published two days back by MIT Press. The title of the book is Academic Star Wars, Excellence Initiatives in Global Prospectives. And in fact, he told me before the session started, it is an open source, so you can easily go for that one. Without further delay, I think, uh, join me to welcome Professor Jamil, and Professor Jamil, floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Good morning to all of you and my sincere thanks to the Oman Authority for Quality Assurance and the Arab Network for Quality Assurance. 
It's really a great honor. It's the second time I have the pleasure of participating in one of your annual meetings. And uh, I would like to join Dr. Joha, who said this morning that it was very emotional and we feel privileged to participate in this homage for Professor Abad Abul Eila. I had the pleasure of knowing him and uh, he was really a, an, an intellectual light and a very gentle person. He's uh, uh, very much missed. As the moderator kindly said, I've been working for more than 30 years, first with the World Bank and now on my own, advising governments and universities. And one of the frustrations is that you wonder, what are you achieving in your life? How are you really making a difference? And I have to thank Nadia Badrawi because thanks to her, I think I have made a difference. Back in the early 2000s, there were a few champions of quality assurance who came to the World Bank pushing for the establishment of regional networks and asking for resources. As you know, the World Bank gives loans, but in this case, with my team, we were able to uh, apply successfully for a grant that supported not only INQUAHI, the overall network for quality assurance, but also the regional ones in Asia, in the Arab world, in Africa, in Latin America. Uh, not all of them had been very successful, but I must say that when I see the energy and the, the rich intellectual debate that has taken place yesterday and, and continuing today, I'm um, indirectly proud. I don't have anything to do with it, but I'm so glad that uh, Nadia and her colleagues were able to transform the dream into a reality. A big applause, congratulations uh, for Nadia. And since uh, Nadia and her brother are medical doctors, and maybe there are more of you in the audience, I, I would like to share my observation, and I hope you agree with me, of the contrast between medicine and education. People say that if Newton were to come back today and go walk into a hospital room or a surgery room, he would not recognize anything. But if he goes into a classroom, he would not be surprised because it's very much like it was many hundred years ago. So these are pictures from the 50s when I was born in, the, in that decade. And um, if we look at medicine today, it's so changed. Now we have robots. Um, performing surgery, we can do telemedicine, we can do all sorts of sophisticated uh, CAT scans and magnetic resonance and tests, etc. It's a transformed world. But this is a classroom when I was going to primary school in Morocco in the late 50s, and recently I went back and I took a picture of a primary school classroom today not much change. It's still a lot of rote learning, listening passively to what the teacher tells us. Even the ceremonial dimension, so you have here a depiction of a graduation ceremony in the Middle Ages, and a month ago I was in Kenya and I took a picture of a graduation ceremony, not much difference. Except, since you notice the masks, with the COVID pandemic. If you think about it, we have experienced the most dramatic mass experiment with high education. Because all over the world, from one week to the other, sometimes from one day to the other, the campuses of more than 25,000 high education institutions had to close and to send back home more than 150 million students. And from one day to the other, we had to experiment with what most of us consider as second class education, online education. In fact, in most countries, they had a special quality assurance procedures and sometimes agency, because it was not the noble face-to-face -face approach to education. 
so against this background, I have divided my presentation into three parts. I want to briefly evoke the digital revolution, talk a little bit about the rise of artificial intelligence, and finally, what does it mean for quality assurance? So as the pandemic is going away, I hope, we, most of us, we just want to go back to the normal life, right? The old normal, but is there something like the old normal? Can we introduce innovations or just like this gentleman say, no, thank you, we are too busy reconstructing. I think that we have to recognize that we need a new education model. When professors were desperately trying to uh, record their lectures and put them online, they realized that the students were not interested, they were not learning. We need to move away from a teacher-centered approach to a student-centered approach with innovative curricular, pedagogical, and assessment practices. And I should add another word because somebody reminded me during the, um, the, the, the break that it has also to be linked to real life. Otherwise, we will have graduate unemployment, something that we are suffering in most of our Arab region, certainly in my country, Morocco. So what does it mean? There is a new book on student-centered learning, on active and interactive learning, which captures it all. It's called Sparking Curiosity, Igniting Passion, Unleashing Genius. And I would like to show you a short video to illustrate in two minutes what it means to try to make things that may be seen as boring traditionally into something exciting, stimulating. This video takes place in a metro station in Stockholm, the capital city of Sweden. Could you kindly play the video? So I hope you got the point. How do we make the education experience stimulating? How do we get our students to have fun? And unlike the 20th century, have an education approach in the 21st century when learning is not a spectator sport anymore, where the lecture is out. I visited many years ago, a new 15 years ago, a new college of engineering south of Boston called All In College of Engineering. In my humble opinion, it's the most revolutionary place where the students work by uh, study by team. They learn by doing things, resolving problems. And look from the pictures I took, uh, you can see already the dynamism. And they don't have lecture halls, they don't have classrooms. It's all by doing projects in studios. Now, the big problem, and I think Dr. Nadia mentioned that in her opening yesterday, is that we have a huge gap between most of the professors who are 
still digital dinosaurs. I'm just using the words that some professors I interviewed use themselves. And then we have this new species of human beings, our children or grandchildren, who are born with different thumbs because they use the smartphone and the iPad. I hate, I'm very careful now not sharing my iPad with my two-year-old grandson because the first time I did time and last time, I could not get into my iPad anymore after that. <laughs> so this is my, my grandson, the, the culprit of this activity. Now this is a picture from a school bus in South Korea. And what, look at that. On the way to school, the students are already, these are secondary school students, they are already busy uh, going onto the internet and uh, being digital. So we need to accept that this is the brick university is gone, now it's the click university. What does it mean to have a digital university? And I've, I'm repeating some of the things that the previous speakers have very brilliantly presented. First, we can transform how we do teaching and learning online. We can use e-learning, the students can learn by themselves or with their peers. We can use virtual tutors, AI-driven software, and uh, we, they will, or bots who will respond to your questions, or you have a software. Yesterday, somebody asked a question, what if a student already knows half of the of the program, do I, can I allow him or her to do only half? Yes, with these softwares, the important thing is at the end, they, they take the assessment and you can check whether they have learned or not. Experiential learning. We have this employment, unemployment problem. Why? Because the students are not well prepared. So we can use virtual labs for teaching and learning, many of which are free open resources. We have the so-called meta-universities where we will go around virtually. We can have a virtual reality environment. We can do simulations to train pilots, to train surgeons, to train nurses in, in many disciplines. And the assessment changes from summative to formative assessment so that instructors and the students can get immediate feedback. Self, you can do self-assessment during e-learning. You can constitute an e-portfolio of traditional degrees and the micro-credentials that you accumulate. And you can use blockchain to have digital certificates and degrees what we, we cannot, many countries have a problem of fraud. I will not name them, but uh, recently there were surveys in several countries looking at how many Congress men, and usually it's men, but Congress uh, members had fake uh, degrees. But when you have digital degrees, uh, you can be protected from that. We can use digital tools for research, do internet-based experiments, virtual labs for research, AI-generated hypotheses that allow you to explore new paths of thinking that you didn't think about, collaborative platform, platforms across the world. For management of universities, we use, uh, for academic management, learning management systems. Now, we were preoccupied if you do exams online, how do you make sure that students are not cheating so you have e-proctoring, we can optimize the infrastructure using artificial intelligence, schedule instructors and matching them with classes, etc. And very importantly, retention, improve the retention because in many countries, out of 100 students who enter first year, only 50 or less will graduate. Um, so you can identify at-risk students very quickly and then provide them with bespoke academic support adapted to their specific needs. Uh, let me mention a tragedy that occurred in November 2019 in a New Zealand university, I will not name it, but they found a student dead in the dormitory in his room. That's very sad, it occurs unfortunately. But the bad thing, the an incredible thing is that they realized that he had been dead for one month and nobody had paid attention. What kind of a university doesn't realize that a student is missing in action for one month? 
There are universities, Georgia Tech in the US is a leader in that respect, that use sensors and artificial intelligence to keep track. So if a student, for example, has the pattern of going to the cafeteria so many times a week, in all of the sudden that student doesn't go to the cafeteria, doesn't go to class, or doesn't have good grades, they will have a red alert, and you have people in student services who will immediately step in. Is it a problem of money? Of, uh, is it a psychological challenge, a medical difficulty, or, or does the student need help? Just a few pictures to illustrate the example. This is um, a robot in a German university using artificial intelligence. This is the teaching assistant for the students. And I'm told the, the students prefer uh, the, that chatbot to the previous uh, human uh, instructor. On the left and the right, you can see pictures of meta universities. Here, the, with the use of uh, virtual reality, University in uh, New Zealand, University of Victoria, for example, decided that they would use VR platforms as their main way of teaching and learning. And it's like being able to do a field visit every day. And it's not only for engineering or geology, but for all their disciplines. Uh, in uh, medicine, for example, now you have virtual labs to do anatomy, to do dissection, to do all sorts of experiments and simulations. The use of 3D printer, of course, allows engineering students to experiment, have prototypes, and uh, print them. This is a hologram uh, used by a professor at the Tech of Monterrey, one of the most uh, technology advanced university in Mexico and Latin America. And they have campuses all over the country. I think they have 26 of them. And so the same professor is present in each of the classroom and can respond to questions uh, asked uh, live by the students. And those of us who like old books, right? Well, the, we now move to digital libraries where we have much more access because we can access the entire world, all the libraries of the world. Uh, um, a brother-in-law of mine uh, from uh, Lubnan is a professor of robotics in Montreal, and he is lucky that he has in his lab this rover, which cost $32 million. It's like the one that goes on planet Mars, but the beauty is that he has PhD students connected through the internet in Africa and Latin America, and they can do these experiments without having their university having to buy this expensive equipment. This is a cloud-based uh, uh, lab that uh, combines mathematics, informatics, and biology for research. This is a virtual labs we can do. We have virtual labs in chemistry, biology, physics, etc., and at no cost because, as I mentioned, many of them are accessible free of charge. And then the use of big data to look at the patterns, how students learn or do not learn and apply that. And this is just an application of blockchain. This graduate of the Tech of Monterey proudly shows us her digital degree. And it's even in sports. You may be aware that eSports is becoming so frequent. So this is a Korean or Japanese university uh, and it's a lab for esports instead of having to build these huge uh, athletic facilities. So, very briefly, the rise of artificial intelligence, because uh, that was covered very brilliantly yesterday uh, by Kato. So, what a question. What do we do with ChatGPT? Uh, Oxford University, Cambridge, when it first started a year ago, they said it's forbidden. Now, I don't know how you can enforce that. Um, uh, I will not go through this because you, you um, can to explain that very well. But uh, today at Harvard, for example, in computer science, they use artificial intelligence. You have a chatbot that guides the students and helps them debug code if there is a mistake, give feedback on their design of program, answer individual questions about error messages and unfamiliar lines of code. And there have been surveys to see how the, that you realize that the students could not tell the difference. If they called, um, they went online for, to, to have a chat, they couldn't tell whether it was a human being 
or artificial intelligence, they could not tell the difference. Benefits, we can enrich, as was said yesterday, both the content and the pedagogy of teaching. AI can pre-create lessons plans, facilitate discussions. Uh, those of you who still teach, you know how difficult it is to give examples. So you spend an hour thinking one, two, three examples. ChatGPT and the other platforms uh, can generate dozens and dozens of examples and ex explanations. They can develop low-stake tests and provide per individualized learning through adaptive learning. And uh, they can prepare students for using AI at work. And AI is available 20 hours a day, every day of the week. Now, of course, there are dangers, academic dishonesty, cheating. Um, how do we keep, if AI is writing everything for us, how do we keep our critical thinking? How are we creative? Uh, aren't we at risk of losing some skills? Um, I don't think everybody realizes how we're gonna have new sweet products that are already mentioned in the case of uh, Microsoft or today, but it's gonna be even more powerful in two years. Uh, both Google and Microsoft and others will, will integrate completely AI in their suite. Um, and we don't, we're not ready. I keep asking, and I did that uh, with some of you today, do you have a national policy on AI as Ministry of Higher Education or as Quality Assurance Agency? Many, very few countries have that, and yet it's very important because the world is changing. So what does it mean to finish for quality assurance? I like this definition of compliance. You know. Quality assurance is about establishing standards and making sure that universities and professors are following the rules, right? And meanwhile, the world is changing very fast. We have disruption. And the challenge for you is how do you keep up with all these disruptive approaches and behaviors. So what needs to be changed? We have to accept that face-to-face -face is one modality, but that online is here to stay. It can be hybrid also, a combination of both. It can be high flex. We have alternative paths with recognition of prior learning, self-learning, on-the-job learning. We had a very interesting case study from Malaysia yesterday all the new qualifications, micro-credentials, MOOCs, mini-masters, how do you in, uh, incorporate them? And very importantly, lifelong learning framework. I'm very grateful to Dr. Hossam for mentioning that this morning. My, d my motto, I remember when I had a screensaver, I, I used, used to say, learning never ends, as you demonstrated with your own example. We, ling we live much longer. And so we need to reskill, learn together. On the left, you can see the traditional approach. We go to school, do a bachelor's degree, maybe come back for a master's, and that's it for the rest of our life. No, now the education experience is to study a little bit, go to work, come back to study, go to work, and it's a non-stop process. I see very few universities changing for that respect. Most of you are still this pyramid with graduate students and undergrad. My prediction is that the university of the future will be with like this star where the traditional young students will just be a minority. But more important for you will be to provide continuous professional education or uh, career change programs for people who want to do something else. And the prediction is that if young people will have six, seven, eight different professions. Not the same job in a different company, but moving on to something else. So what do you need to change? And I will finish quickly. Uh, new standards adapted to the changes in delivery modes and new qualifications. I still see quality assurance agency going for accreditation, counting the number of books in the library. So you are penalized if you don't have books. Maybe you have a digital library. Uh, we have to check the reliability and security of the cyber infrastructures. We have to be less input and process oriented and more results based, looking at competencies acquired, at employment results. We need to move from a compliance approach to a trust-based accreditation modality. 
and some countries are doing it. Australia is a leader. Uh, Ireland, they will just assess the internal quality assurance, not the programs or the institution itself. And you need also to become, it's not only quality control, quality assurance, but quality enhancement through capacity building and providing guidance on all these changes, including uh, ChatGPT, as I mentioned. And now it's going to be less about the technical content of the programs, but the generic complex capacities and co um, competencies that graduates should acquire. Information analysis, critical thinking, problem solving, and if we surrender our thinking to the robots, to the machines, are we still human? Global contextual analysis, teamwork and collaboration. If you think about it, from kindergarten to PhD, we are being assessed as individuals. But in real life, I ask you, which professions do people still work as individuals? Teams of surgeons, the pilots, the, the flight deck of a plane, lawyers in every profession we work as teams. Communication, creativity, and ethics. We don't want to train only professionals who are gonna make money, but people who are ethical, who will be good citizens and will try to contribute to a better world. In conclusion, I want to show you this picture. It is from 1900, and a French writer was trying to think, how will education look in 2000? And this is the image he came up with how we would have knowledge coming into our brain. 11 years ago, the, vice, the president of Stanford University warned about the tsunami coming to high education. And because, even though he's in California, he was not talking about the real tsunami of the Pacific Ocean. He was talking about universities in the digital era. Nobody paid attention to him until COVID and online learning came. So the future is already here. Beware. We cannot be stuck in the past. We need to move on. I like this quote from Mark Twain, the journalist and writer who used to say, I love progress. It is change I cannot stand. And that's our challenge. How do we make sure that our professors embrace change, feel comfortable, not feel threatened? And advanced technology, as has been done, said during these two days, can change our world. But it's not using technology for the sake of technology. Always ask ourselves, what do we do with technology? If it enhances learning and management and assessment, it's meaningful. If it replaces our thinking, it's very dangerous. And I'll finish with an anecdote from my country, Morocco, where we used to have this beautiful, gracious animal, the gazelle, which had a terrible life because every morning, the gazelle wakes up thinking, today, once again, I need to run faster than the fastest lion if I don't want to be eaten up alive. Now I ask you, do you think the lion has an easier life? I'm not so sure because every morning the lion wakes up thinking today once again, I need to run faster than the slowest gazelle if I don't want to starve by the end of the day. So what's the moral of this little story? It doesn't make a difference whether you are small or big, whether you are poor or rich, you cannot afford to stay put, because believe me, the Quality Assurance Agency of Australia or South Africa or Finland is not going to wait for you to get your act together. You have to move with the progress. You have to adapt because universities are looking up to you for guidance, for support, for enhancement. Now, you may telling me that I'm showing you a tough world, a challenging and fair world,
But that's the world we have. And the beauty of the world of higher education and of quality assurance is that we have a long tradition of collaboration and cooperation. And your networks are the proof of it. And what you are doing together here and when you are working together from a distance during the year. I always say, we say, in that way we say, right? So if you work together, you'll be better able to exchange experience and build capacity building together. So I leave you with a quote from the Roman philosopher Seneca, who told us more than 2,000 years ago that there is no favorable wind for those who don't know where they are going. Thank you, Professor Jamil, for that uh, rich and nice presentation. So I think our colleagues, uh, the audience, uh, will have a chance either uh, asking the question through uh, scanning the QR code, or I will leave even uh, after uh, the floor for you to ask live questions. So I think, uh, Professor Jamil, uh, you highlighted in your presentation the digital transformation and the rise of artific artificial intelligence. And uh, then at the end, you talked about the challenges that the quality assurance agents are, are facing. So let me start by a question from my side. I think there is uh, always some people are claiming that the old generation, although the technology was not that advanced, but you can say that the quality, I would say, in, in a good level. So how do you see the importance of recognition of prior learning and how to answer that one in terms of people are saying not necessarily with the advancement of technology, that the new generation is a better quality than the other generation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for this question. We've already, we heard yesterday about the importance and efforts of uh, some countries to recognize prior learning. And if you allow me a, a personal story to show you how meaningful it can be. In fact, in a way, I would not be here in front of you if recognition of prior learning didn't exist because my father was born in 1921 in Rebat in, uh, in, uh, in Morocco, and he went to the Quranic school. But then he was found to be quite intelligent, so they sent him to what they called during the French colonization, the school for the sons of notable people, even though he was from a very poor family. And he studied up to four years of high school, secondary education, but he never finished. He never got finished what the French called baccalaureat, which is the passport to go to university. So he started teaching as a primary school teacher in the mountains, and he had some French colleagues, and again, they recognized that he was quite talented, so they pushed him to further to continue his studies. And in 1948, he, he arrives in Paris, but he doesn't have baccalaureate, and he wants to continue his studies in classical Arabic. And so he went to the School of Oriental Studies, and luckily, there were some open-minded professors who recognized that he had knowledge and talent and he became, I'm very proud of that, the first Moroccan to ever get a PhD at a French university in 1951. And so if he had not been given this opportunity, even though he didn't have the degree, I would not be here to tell you the story. Thank you, Professor Jimmy. So I think I'll take uh, some questions from uh, basically here, the audience that ask already. There's a question that says, it seems digital transformation and future of institutions lies heavily on financial capacity with which a lot of higher education institutions are struggling. How can higher uh, education institutions 
is working on that. Yes, if you visit top universities, I mean in the US, for example, some of the technology advanced institutions would be Stanford, MIT, Arizona State University, you may have heard, they've been so dynamic, Purdue University, but, and they have billions, not millions, they have billions. But you can do also low-tech technology that will be powerful. You can have an internal server where you download information and you don't need access to the internet. Maybe if, if I told, tell you about an anecdote, I think it was in Argentina. Um, school inspector goes into a rural school and he finds a classroom where nothing is happening. The professor is sitting and looks desperate. The students look bored. And he asks her, What's, why aren't you teaching? And she said, because I don't have, we don't have resources. I don't have pedagogical support. He said, well, let me show you something. And he takes a cork from his pocket. And he says, this is, comes from a tree. It is cut. And you can build boats with that. And you can do many things. And so the kids were looking at him. And they were excited. And so he thought he had explained something important to the teacher. So he goes away. And five years later, by accident, he drives by this school. And he's curious. I want to see how transformed it is. And when he walks into the classroom, the same apathy, boring students, nothing is happening. So he asked the teacher, what happened? I thought you had learned a lesson. She, sa she said, I lost the cork. So I think, Professor Jamil, I'll ask a question from my side. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation about ChatGPT. And right now, everyone is talking about ChatGPT. And I think even you can publish a paper, I mean, co-authored with ChatGPT. So do you think ChatGPT will be a challenge or a threat on the higher education? Well, as was demonstrated yesterday, I think it's both important. Let me take a show of hands. Who in the audience has used ChatGPT? And do you feel threatened or empowered? <laughs> My experience is that if you know your subject well, ChatGPT can save time for you, can open new ideas, right? But it can also be dangerous. Kato mentioned yesterday the hallucinations. Two months ago in the US courts of justice, a lawyer was defending somebody and was using very proudly this precedent and this decision and this decision. And the lawyers, the judge stopped him and said, excuse me, what are your sources? I'm well experienced. I've never heard of this and this and this. And the lawyer looks baffled. He said, well, that's what Chad GPD told me. And Chad GPD had totally invented, right? My daughter teaches at the university in the US. And just yesterday, I was talking to her. What are you doing? She said, I'm grading papers. It's the end of the term. And I'm so mad because I have this student. I know he didn't write his essay. It's Chad GPT, but I cannot prove it. The university doesn't have a policy. So we have to think about, we have to teach and to learn how to use these platforms intelligently, because as we have been reminded yesterday, they are not necessarily smart. We, so critical thinking becomes even more important than it was before. We have to be ethical. If I use ChatGPT, I have to quote, to mention, to acknowledge, to develop this paragraph, I use ChatGPT. A university president two weeks ago gave the commencement address. And at the end, she said, big applause, very nice. I have to confess, it was written entirely 
by chat GPT. So it's a revolution, it's happening fast, and we need to prepare not to be overwhelmed, but really to use it again intelligently and for our purpose. Thank you, Professor Jamil. Uh, I think I'll take a question and then I'll open uh, the floor for the audience to ask uh, live questions. Professor Jamil, there's a question that says, having talked about dangers of artificial intelligence, do you think policies that organize the use of AI should come from the Ministry of Education rather than the university itself in order to standardize the practice? I think that the Ministry of Higher Education or the Quality Assurance Agency should provide guidelines and a synthesis of what we know. Every day, I don't know how many articles are written about the threats, the positive uses, and everything. So it's changing every day. And it's not fair to expect that each university or individual professor will be able to do this scanning to follow up. And that's, again, where a network like yours can be powerful. If I were allowed to make a suggestion, I would designate within the network a small task force whose responsibility would be to feed the member quality assurance agencies with do a screening of what we know about ChatGPT and the other generative um, artificial intelligence, how it can be used, what are the dangers, and that has to happen on a regular, daily, almost daily basis. And here again, you can leverage the power of working together. Thank you, Mr. Jimmy. Then I, I think I'll ask, I mean, uh, the audience, if they have uh, questions. Uh, Mike, please, uh, Professor Hassan. Allow me, because I mean, he raised his hand from the beginning of the session. Professor Hassan. Uh. I just want to congratulate you on magnificent, wonderful lecture. You opened my eyes <laughs> and you did not forget the humanity part with the digitalization. To join together. Thank you very much. I just wanted to thank you. Thank you, Professor Hassan. And I think we all agree on that point. Dr. Mustafa. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this uh, very informative presentation. Uh, I think uh, I just want to mention that uh, as for Hamdan bin Mohammed Smart University, we distributed our certificate graduation certification four years ago using blockchain. And uh, we are uh, very high uh, fast pasting on technology. When I yesterday asked about the, uh, can we offer the personalization required? Uh, my question was uh, related to the accrediting agencies. Uh, we need uh, some of the universities, including Hamdan, uh, smart University are moving very fast when it comes to technology. But my question is about the accreditation agencies. I think they, we need, they need to move fast as well to keep pace with the technologies that we already have. Thank you very much. No, I fully agree. And if I were to summarize with two words how quality assurance agencies need to change, and that applies also to university. It's flexibility and speed. I go around and work in many countries, and I see the same frustrations among universities that innovate, because if they want to have a new program or a new way of teaching, it may take a year, if they are lucky, two years to get the authorization, right? to revise the curriculum, you are told that 
if you change more than 30%, you have to reapply for your program's authorization. Um, remember I mentioned all-in college of engineering. One of their principles is the principle of expiry. They will never teach the same course in the same way, twice, because the world is changing. So every time they are trying to revising. So if you have a quality assurance agency that is either rigid or slow, that slows you down, you cannot adapt to the new world. So flexibility and speed, and that's why the focus on the results, on the competencies, on how employers view your graduates are much more important than counting how many square meters of classrooms you have, how many books in the library, etc. Thank you, Mr. Jamil. J just in the sake of time limitation, we have many questions, but talking on your behalf, I think you wouldn't mind if some of the audience will ask you after uh, the session, uh, if they have more uh, questions. Uh, without uh, further delay, I think I would like to uh, Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Jamil, for that uh, rich uh, presentation and thanking for sharing uh, your experience. And think this is a challenge that we have to cope with. And thank you again. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I would like to welcome you to the general sessions uh, seven and eight. Uh, gener uh, general session seven is a study on implementation of integrating online learning fully and blended forms and its quality assurance in Jordan universities. Our speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Wafer Sarayra. Professor Wafer Sarayra is currently the President of Accreditation and Quality Assurance Commission for Higher Education Institutions in Jordan. He received his PhD in American Literature in 1998 from Ohio University in the United States. Professor al Saraira has an extensive work experience as he was the President of Mu'ta University, Vice President of Mu'ta University for International uh, Relations and Quality Assurance and, dean, and uh, uh, dean of the Faculty of Arts. He taught at several universities, including Mu'ta University, Qatar University, Arab Open University, and Ohio University. In addition, he has more than 30 research papers and books. Professor Asaraira has good experience in quality assurance and accreditation of higher education institutions as he contributed in the development of standards and indicators of accreditation and quality assurance. He is a member in many local, regional, and international bodies in the field of accreditation and quality assurance. Please welcome with me Professor Bafir Sarayra. First of all, I would like to get this chance to thank Dr. Joha for giving me the chance to visit Oman for the first time. And I'm very much pleased also to meet my colleagues from different agencies in the Arab world and internationally in this promising conference. And also I have got the chance to meet other experts in the field with whom I have got some connections and communications so that we can establish good connections in in the future. 
Before I start my presentation, I would like to give some keys actually about the essence of this presentation as actually I was, uh, uh, I was uh, uh, when I had a discussion at the beginning of the conference, the establishment of the conference, I was thinking of giving a presentation about a study that we have uh, actually delivered in Jordan after COVID-19 as a result of the implementation of the online kind of progress that we had in, in, in Jordan. But before then, and before giving into the details, which are very technical and it might be a bit boring, I changed my mind actually, and after having uh, heard some presentations by, by our colleagues uh, from different parts of the world and in the Arab region in particular, I, I am gonna shift it in a way to make it uh, uh, acceptable in a way and, and, and rich on, on the other hand as well. In Jordan, and this is, I mean, to the comments made by Dr. Badrawi in the morning, he mentioned an important area. Do we have the power to close some universities, state universities? Well, the answer in Jordan, yes, we can. And we have actually, not universities, but the, at the level of colleges and the programs. We in Jordan, we have a higher council of education that is the policy maker. And this is it's in control and of making and shaping the policies but we have another, another also council, which is Akachi Council that I am the president of. And this one is not connected to the ministry at all, but it is privately connected to the prime minister. And, and we have the full power to practice any kind of good practice that we think is it fruitful. And I mean, just in the last semester, we stopped around 172 programs in public universities. So the answer is yes. If we find out there's a problem with a certain program, we we'll give some penalties. We, we actually direct these universities and programs for certain reasons. But after that, we can have and we have the ability to stop them. So we are, I mean, it has the power. We can do something if we are willing to. But what I feel shy of actually is that we have different agencies in the Arab world and we have different ways and methodologies being implemented in one country to another. And this is actually, if we need to make one recommendation as a result of this conference, is that we have to have identical procedures in the Arab world in terms of quality assurance because this will lead us to something fruitful something comparable to what I mentioned in my comments yesterday. We need to have a benchmark with international, let's say, agencies and to implement them in our countries so that we can improve the quality of what we have in, in our countries. And this could be one of the you know, uh, uh, results of such a fruitful conference. Now, the case in Jordan, when it comes to online, back before COVID, we had almost only one general uh, uh, decision made by High Education Council in which they allowed universities to, to use only up to 20 percentile of the program to be taught blendedly in a form of a blended kind of learning to be online. And in reality, in a practice, none of which had taken place only in one or two universities, which was very slight, which means that all universities, with exception of one or two, had the experience and the good experience in implementing the online. And up to this moment, we don't have, our, our bylaws and regulations would not allow online universities until, until this moment. Well, somebody might ask why? Well, the answer is because we wanted to go gradually, because we want to make sure, and this is the job of Akachi actually. Once decisions are made, either by Akachi Council or the Higher Education Council, then it comes the role of Akachi to follow up, to implement on a yearly basis, and sometimes on per semester, because we want to make sure that everything is is, is, is working in a, very, in a very proper way. Now, with the advent of COVID back in 2019 and the beginning of 2020, we had a drastic problem. We had a major problem in implementing the online. So everybody started, presidents, vice presidents, deans, and faculty members, started just, I mean, to misunderstand the concept of online, 
bus just, for example, just having the long distance kind of communication that a faculty is being at home or in his office. The students are being at home. They will just open the laptops and computers and they will just touch. And they define this as being the meaning of the online. Now, in the presentation, actually in the, in the conference that we attended, uh, we attended yesterday, we had, I mean, not, not yesterday, but two days ago, in Brussels, in, uh, sorry, in Barcelona, we had the attendance of about 72 universities from different parts of the world, and it was uh, funded by Erasmus Plus, actually. And uh, we had a, a major question at that conference. Has any university or country, covering about 42 countries, has any country made the regulations to be mandatory for the online? And the answer was, Yes, by two countries only, which means that countries after COVID, they started forgetting about the online and they started turning into the face-to-face -face because of the challenges and sometimes they said there is no need for that at, at all. Now, what we thought about in Jordan is that we had to change the regulations. And we started by, as we know, in Jordan we have the bylaws have to be changed and the bylaws have been changed accordingly in 2021. And then we had also the standards to be changed either by Akachi, and then we developed them by using the QM standards. And we started orienting the universities to follow up these standards. And then we started to implement what we, what we have in this, the implementation of that. The first of which actually was the executive action plan made by, made by the council. And the bylaw was approved and issued by a royal decree, which means there is no a step back to the implementation of online learning, because this is, this is an implementation of reality and there's no way back to, to do it. The, regula the regulations also for the integrating online learning into higher education institutions by the Mohi Council were made and declared in 2021. And this was also taken seriously by all universities. And when I talk about universities, I'm talking about 32 universities covering more than 3,000 programs, which means that we have around 15,000 faculty members. So we had to look into the e-content on the one hand, the infrastructure on the other, and we have also to look at both the students and the faculty members to be ready to do what Sue called. Now, when we started thinking about how to implement the online as beginning from scratch to moving to the drastic change that we needed by looking at the international experiences, we thought of a number of options. And the last of which, which was implemented is to identify actually what we call the ratios. I mean, we can't start to and go fully online, but we started with the ratios. The first one, and this is part of the bylaws made in, in Jordan and by Akachi Council in, in particular. The first one, every, in every program, we have to have 10 to 20 percentile of the course to be taught, to be taught, it's not working. Anyway, we, we can continue that. Is it? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay, it's working now. Well, I have, I have infection actually. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Oops, no, I think we need to go back. Uh, okay. I think it's Oops. Well, I think, yeah, this is what we sent actually previously, and I think it's not the right presentation. Anyways, yeah, I sent it a few days ago, and they double checked with them in the morning, and they said, yeah, but I think this is, this, is, this is not the right presentation, anyways. Yeah, anyways, no problem with that. Well, actually, as we said, in the bylaws, we started by specifying, specifying the ratios for universities to start the implementing the online. 
And the first part of the regulations is that every university is required to, to, to change 10 to 20 percentile of the courses to be taught fully online. And by the fully online, we talk about the synchronized and the asynchronized kind of teaching with certain criteria made by Akachi Council. And we have been following and implementing what they have done so far. As for the blended in each program, we have the ability, every university has the ability, and it is part of the bylaw, which means it's not optional, it is obligatory, to have 40 to 60 percentile for humanities courses in arts, in sciences, in education, in sharia, studies, and so on and so forth. But in the scientific and medical schools and other medical schools, they have the right to use the blended form of teaching from 30 to 50 percentile. And this means there is a drastic kind of change in the development of the online learning in universities, either, either in, the in the fully kind of online or in the partial or in the blended kind of, of, of blended learning. Also, we had made an exit for some exceptions to some universities and to some programs which are practical in case. And here, we have put an exit so that a university which requires a kind of exit, for example, to have extra or less than this ratio, they can request it from, from, from the Ministry of Higher Education Council. Now, as a, a result of these decisions and regulations made by 2021, we started the follow-up on the implementation of such ratios. And to do so, we had to come up with the standards. And these standards were derived from the best international practices, the most important of which was, was the, the QM. Now, when it comes to the fully online learning, the ratio of the synchronized learning to the ratio of the synchronized learning is in a three credit curve as is either two thirds to one third model. And here we could have either the two plus one or we have the two synchronized online learning and the one asynchronized kind of learning. Or they could have it, have to have. For example, in a class that is a three credit hour, if we have two meetings per week, they can have one, one lecture to be fully online and the second lecture to be face to face. But and again, here the implementation of the fully online criteria and standards have to be met carefully according to, to what, we have, to with what we have done. In the blended kind of learning, and here we had actually a, 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 a problem at the beginning because not so many universities were ready for this implementation of this. Professor Wafer, you have two minutes, please. Okay. Okay, when, with part of the standards that we have for the QM, they had, the universities has to develop their policies, they have to develop the technical infrastructure, they had the academic technical support of faculty, the academic and technical support for students, and the mechanism for a student's evaluation in, in the fully online learning. Now, if we want to, I mean, after the visits we made to all of these universities for last year, 22, 23, I mean, the, the development was so great, actually and we sent comments to the universities so that they can correct what was noticed by our experts in that field, and they were sent the recommendations for commitments. If we want to summarize the comments and the problems, or let's say the shortcomings that universities were facing at that time, they would be, I mean, categorized in terms of not having the capacity in terms of the staff member, so we oblige universities to hire more staff members in these centers, the online centers, so that they would cope up with the large number of courses to be taught online. And the second issue was related to the e-content of the courses. Most of them implemented the early beginnings of the e-content, but we, never, we rather needed to have more and more into that, and this will lead to the development of the online. And we hope that in the coming future, so that we have the annual kind of follow-up on the implementation of on time, uh, online, so that in the coming couple of years, we will have the legacy and we will have the, uh, what we call the target needed by, 
by all of us to cope up with what is being practiced internationally. If you want to summarize the whole thing, I would say it was a successful story in Jordan for implementing the online if compared to what we had in the past. Once again, I apologize for the presentation, but I sent it just two days ago. That was the old one, not the new one. Thank you again, and we hope you enjoy. Thank you very much, Professor Bafer. Uh, now the next session uh, uh, will be presented by Dr. Rafa Al-Mansouri on preparing faculty and graduates for AI-based world. Dr. Rafa Al-Mansouri is the Vice President of Institutional Effectiveness and Accreditation at the American University of Bahrain. She is responsible for developing and leading institutional research and program assessment implementation. She brings with her, with her more than 30 years of experience in higher education, of which more than 15 years are in quality assurance and accreditation of higher education institutions and academic programs. Dr. Al-Mansouri was a member of the team that developed the higher education quality review system of the Kingdom of Bahrain and worked with the Education and Training Quality Authority for more than 12 years. Dr. Al-Mansouri serves on external uh, review, reviewer register of the Oman Authority for Academic Accreditation and Quality Assurance of Education and is an active member of the Bahrain Society of Engineers. She received her BSc degree in Electrical Engineering from University of Bahrain, her master's degree in Microelectronic System and Communications from University of Liverpool, uh, in the UK, and her PhD de degree from Tufts, Tufts University in the United States. Uh, please welcome Dr. Rafa Al Mansouri uh, and to present this. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I would like first to thank. And Kahe and the OAAAQA for this kind invitation to be participating in this uh, workshop, uh, this conference, sorry. And it's very hard to be coming now after all the great speakers talking about the uh, artificial intelligence and its influence on the teaching and learning. So um, I'm just waiting for my presentation, I guess. Go in. Um, I guess one time before I was in a presentation teaching, giving a forum on how to use technology in teaching and learning, and the first thing I told my audience was that be prepared that technology fails you every now and then. And today, technology is failing us with, the, with this slide. So let's go forward and uh, start with the presentation. Um, I will not go that much into explaining what is uh, or generative AI uh, systems, as this has been uh, explained a lot within the last uh, yesterday and the last sessions today. But I want to focus mainly on generative AI when it comes to AI test, uh, text uh, tools and how these specific AI text tools are embedding uh, the embedding basically the, um, if we move to the, to the fourth slide, that will be great. Uh, the third slide, sorry. Okay, uh, how basically the generative uh, AI are affecting 
the learning process. But before that, let me just bring your attention to what learning is and what learning is from the old days of Socrates, basically it's a debate, it's a discussion between the teacher and the student. The teacher starts with a prompt, a question, and that question is debated, and the student basically replies and brings their own questions, and the discussion is taken forth and back, and based on that, learning takes a place. Similarly, Ibn al-Haytham would say that it is basically an action that is taken by human beings uh, meant to instill some kind of knowledge or um, character within, within the person himself. And recently what we say about education does not differ that much. So they all kind of fell in the same relationship between the teacher and the mentor, the relationship of discussion, debate, and the student being part of the learning process. Nevertheless, it is expected more than this from higher education institution these days. We expect them actually to be able to prepare a student for a market that the market itself does not know what it looks like. The market wants the higher education to guess what the market will look like in five years, prepare these students and make make sure that the graduate are ready to go to work the second day they graduate. We don't have a patient market. Market doesn't believe anymore about on-job training as much as it believes uh, about, uh, it believes that the university need to graduate ready on-job uh, trained in uh, universities. And I would argue that universities are not supposed to graduate a trained graduate they are supposed to graduate trainable graduates, and there is a big difference between the two. And that will ensure that the student will be able to go to the second job, the third job, and the fourth job, and so forth, and move as the environment of the work labor changes. Uh, in order to do this, it is expected that the graduate needs to be a decision maker, a team player, uh, they can do commu computational thinking, they can have cognitive uh, flexibility, they can work with, it, with a team, they can resolve conflicts between different teams, and they can manage people. But for all this to happen, there is a base that is needed to be there, a strong base of solid foundation in literacy and in numeracy. And that does not start at the beginning. It doesn't even start in the university. It starts before the university. And this is something that lots of time we look at what is in the top and we forget what is the base needed in order to, to develop the, uh, the higher values. Uh, with, with the numeracy, we are not talking about mathematics. It's important that we differentiate between mathematics and numeracy. It is the ability to interpret data, to look at it within a context, and to look at it within a real world that these data are existing within. Similarly, when it comes to uh, literacy, it is beyond reading and writing and being able to read and write anymore. I would actually argue that it is ICT literacy that needs to be added, and not just me, it's, it's in, the, in the literature and it can be found. There is a nice definition of what is literacy for the 21st century that I would like to share with you. And it simply says it's the ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn. So it is the switches of the brain that needs to be rerouted and reconnected again in order to be able to meet the needs of a very changing market. This is not a new concept, by the way. It was published in 1970, and it was published by Alvin uh, Toffler, expecting what is needed in the 21st century, and it is very, very true. Um, tools change, um, skills change, and if we cannot unlearn, we cannot relearn again. And this is not just for the student. This is also for the faculty. This is also for the educators, because if we stick to what we know, 
we cannot ask the student to unlearn and relearn again. Another thing which is I want to tackle on are two aspects that I think they are very important. The importance of knowledge and the importance of assessment. And let me start with the knowledge. I think there is a misconception that we have participated as, acad as educators in developing, which is that knowledge is not, attaining knowledge, sorry, is not important. Acquiring knowledge is not important, that the knowledge is available, and with a click of a mouse button, we can access it. But I think, I believe that basic knowledge, core knowledge is very important, because that will enable the person to surf within information that are available really extremely widely. And those information will come either from a search engine or a chat uh, bot, basically, such as ChatGPT or uh, uh, Google Bard. If the person does not have the basic knowledge, they will not be able to uh, look at the different information, filter them, critically analyze them, and critically be able to uh, know that the generated text from the AI might not be true. It doesn't make sense. Or sometimes it does, but they need to question it. And uh, the other thing is, in order to learn more, you connect the knowledge you have in a different ways, and you generate a new knowledge. And that is what, what students do. So if they are not as strong, they cannot retrieve the basic knowledge and come back to them. With it, uh, actually, another skill that is looked da down at, but I believe is important, uh, developing good memory. We, we keep saying memorization is not important. And I think memorization is important, but it should not be the only important thing. Because if we cannot remember the basic knowledge, then it becomes a problem. I'll tell you, I'll tell you for example, when I was teaching, I, t I uh, teach electronics a long time ago. I stopped teaching a while. And the students should know that the basic uh, electronic piece, which is the diode, will maintain a voltage between 0.5, uh, sorry, 0.6 to 0.8. So when they are given a problem, if they don't remember that part and they solve and they get a voltage which is 1.2 or 1.3, then, uh, hello, I learned. Uh, so if it is between uh, 1.2 and 1.3 and they put it in a box without even questioning that this answer is wrong because they couldn't remember that a simple diode should be between 0.7 and 0.8, they don't critically look at what they have and they, they do not critically analyze it because they just take whatever comes as a fact and a new fact that they can deal with. Um, I will move basically to why assessment is important. Assessment at the end is the tool that we as educators use in order to know if learning took place, be it as an individual student or collectively within a class. And it is also as a university how we show our accreditors that we have achieved the learning outcome and we have achieved uh, the, the competencies and the skills that we are expecting from students. So it has two folds. It's on an individual level and it's in a class level. So if the assessment integrity is a question, then we really don't know if the learning took place. And I do recall that we discussed that in a number of papers, and for example, one of the solution was that, and lots of institutions do that, in, including my institution, we ask the student to present their work. But the problem with the presentation, we are not evaluating the skill of synthesizing the information. We are evaluating the understanding of the information. They could pull it from another, another uh, a generative AI, or they can pull it from a friend, or wherever they get it. They can understand it, but they cannot generate it. They cannot synthesize the information. They don't know how to collect them, bring them together, make a story out of it. But when the story is there, they understand it, and they can present it. So it depends on the learning outcome that we would like to assess and to evaluate, and based on that, there are learning outcomes which are friendly to AI 
and there are learning outcomes that no, it needs to come directly from the learner and the students. The trick now is we say that we need to have diverse uh, assessment tools. And those diverse assessment tools say that not all assessment should be in a class, timed, proctored, and controlled. And in other words, assessment has to be sometime in the class and sometimes outside the classroom. The outside the classroom is the, the tricky part. And, and also, we say that those will be also fair for students because some students cannot work uh, under pressure. I had a couple of students who were excellent students, but when they sit in a proctored exam, their performance is terrible simply because they panic, simply because they get stressed, and simply because they don't, they cannot basically work under pressure. So their performance is not to their knowledge, but it, it kind of, it's not bad to put them under that because they are learning how to perform under stress, stress but it would be unfair to have it the only way to assess them. So we cannot go back to completely having assessment that are proctored. So what do we need to do then? How do we need to work with that? We need basically, you know, you, because at the end, university's mission is to prepare a student and graduate to be ready for the future. And the future has AI in it and has all these different resources that are available. The other thing is, who says that it is ethical for me as a faculty to use AI to write a grant but it is not ethical for a student to write it, to, base, to use AI to write an essay. So all these questions are basically needed to be addressed within a clear guidelines that is provided by the institution to the, to the student. And I know that there was a question earlier about should uh, the, the uh, regulatory body produced the, the po policy, and I think, no, it should be left to the, to the institution. Dr. Wafa, you have two minutes, please. Two minutes. I'll move fast then. Faculty need to know how to generate, uh, how generative AI works, because if, if they know how the generative system works, that will open a dialogue between them and the student and will enable basically the student to uh, trust that the faculty knows the strength and the weaknesses of their system. It will actually reduce also the chances of the student using or misusing AI because that will put them in a position that the, the faculty knows and we might get caught, okay? Uh, be, I, I am totally for the for uh, faculty should know that the detection tool do not work. We had actually, we have been having a long debate in the last week within my institution about this because of a case that we believe that the student might have been misaccused because they, they, they what the detector says that there is a chance that this has been written by, by uh, generative AI. It does not say that this has been written. Assignments, we need faculty to know to do both. To develop assessment that is basically uh, AI uh, dependent and to be able to uh, develop an assessment that is not AI dependent, in another word, proof from AI uh, utilization. This is an example of using generative AI, and I will go to my last slide basically saying that generative AI is here, like any other system before. Remember when, when the search engine were here and we had all the discussion, actually when the calculator started at the beginning and everybody was discussing, is that right, is that wrong, will that affect the mathematical skills of the student? So it is here, we need to adapt and move forward with it. Thank you. Many thanks to both presenters for their informative presentations. Uh, we'll open the floor for questions now, but I will uh, start uh, with two short questions, one for Dr. Wafa and one for Professor uh, Wafer. Uh, for Dr. Wafa, uh, and maybe it's a good issue for me to unmute. My volume is too low. My volume is better? Okay, 
I just had uh, a problem with my eye, with the retina, so I, I don't know if I, I, I can see this. Uh, uh, given that the generative AI, AI is, is here to stay, this is your last uh, statement, and the evidence from detec detection tools show that they are not working or not decisive, is it practical to or, or easy to always develop AI resistant assignments? What are your thoughts about this? How do we deal with this? I think it depends on the learning outcome that we need to assess. So if the learning outcome is to search, to look, and to utilize AI system in order to improve the, 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 the ability to write, then that will go directly toward the AI system. Actually, I, I did not have time to go through some of the slides, but one of the slides was showing an example. AI uh, text uh, generators are as good as the, uh, their answer is as good as two things. The quality of the prompt that goes as a question. The second is the quality of the input that the AI has been uh, trained through. And we have a problem with, with the quality of the input in this region because the input is biased. We do not generate that much information that goes to the AI. And that is part of our responsibility in order to ensure that there is a little bit reduction of AI that we, we actually can develop even our own uh, chatbot within our institution that relies on the system, but it, ha it is heavily basically trained by local uh, data. But we can uh, train the students on how to do the prompt, and that's why the assignment that I have included, the student were requested to submit the prompt, submit the first draft that was generated by AI, and submit their changes in track change. And we can do it opposite. We can say that submit your first draft, and then look at the outcome of the AI. So, so I think you need to do both. Thank you very much. Uh, my question to uh, Professor Waffer, uh, there are two schools of thought about uh, modes of delivery and the needs of uh, standards. Like Professor Jamil uh, recommended that the new standards to be developed uh, to align with the changing uh, changes in delivery uh, modes, and this is what you are doing in Jordan, I think. Now, the other school of thought is that we can develop standards that are generic enough to cover all modes of delivery. Do we really need uh, special standards for online uh, uh, teaching and learning, uh, and uh, uh, or, or we can use the generic standards like Triple AQA is using, where you can apply? The, the important thing is that you have effective, sustainable process that processes that produce the desired results? Well, thank you very much for this good question, actually. As I said, I mean, if we look at our experience before COVID, I mean, we had no good experience in teaching online. So we thought of, at the beginning, 2020, when we started putting our standards after the bylaws have been issued by a royal decree, we started thinking about something to be generic so that we need, I mean, students and faculty members and families in general to, 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 to adopt themselves to these generic standards and, and so that we can cope up with them in the future to develop them. And I mean, uh, if we started with something to be solid at the early beginning stages, we would have a difficulty because we are still suffering from certain practices here and there because not all universities, faculty members have the, main, have the, the kind competency and the skills in using, in using the online. So what we do actually in Akachi, and this is something, I mean, very dynamic in Jordan because we have, uh, uh, we have a bylaw of our own. So we change our standards, I mean, in a very easy way after we we follow up and and we control what is being uh, uh, practiced in in the different schools that we have so yeah we change them I mean every now and then but if they are generic enough you don't need to change them frequently and every few years you may but need they might, yeah, they might, they might 
vary from one school to another. I mean, I do understand that in medical schools, I mean, the mode of teaching would be somehow different from humanities or, uh, or languages. So, I mean, we, we, we set up this general, generic one, but later on, we, we, we receive feedbacks from faculty and we change them accordingly. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Uh, we have a question here. I would like to highlight the difference between the force exerted by compliance to quality assurance and a force by national visionary strategy relying on quality slows our speed. Could you elaborate? I would like to highlight the difference between the force exer exerted by compliance to quality assurance and force by national visionary strategy relying on quality, it slows our speed. Yeah, does it slow the speed? I did not get the question correctly, I think, but I can make a general comment if I got the question. Yes, they have, yes. Not, not actually, it, well, uh, it has to become, as I mentioned, it has become part of the bylaw. So it's not optional now. Every university, every college has to by abide by these ratios that I mentioned briefly in my presentation. Now, how to implement them, it is according to our standards. And our standards have, we, I mean, the, our benchmark was, was with the QM and the best international practices. So they started in a very slow motion at the early beginnings because we wanted to watch out how things are moving in universities and colleges. After a while, uh, one year later, a year later actually, we started following up them to, to see them in the right direction. And the bylaws and legislations and actual regulations made by every university to follow up and to maintain what we have made at, at the ministry, I mean the higher education council level and at a catch level on the other. So, I mean, they, they, have to, to they have to be matching one another. Thank you, Professor. Dr. Wafa wants to comment on this also. I think I will comment as a person who was in quality assurance, was in university, then quality assurance, then back to university. Um, I am not for enforcing. Um, I think universities move with different speed based on their readiness and your, your survey showed that there is different level of readiness. So to, to box them in the same form might hinder some while might push some who are not ready to actually, um, uh, the outcome will affect the learning experience that the student might have. Um, I think it was mentioned this morning by our keynote speaker, the problem is if the universities are either owned by the government or in owned by, by uh, private uh, stakeholders, then that autonomy of the university is lost and that's what we need to be careful about. This uh, question is to Professor Bafer. كيف يتم تقييم جودة التعليم الإلكتروني في الجامعات الأردنية ومدى تحقيقها لأهداف التعليم المحددة؟ دكتور أنت عندك هذا؟ Yeah, I think the question, uh, uh, I mean, to, to put the answer, is that having put and approved the standards by Akachi. We started having workshops in our office, in our, in our building, and uh, the faculty members, the deans, the presidents, the vice presidents, I mean, got to train to this kind of learning and teaching. And the universities started also, I mean, they have to send us about the number of the faculty and how many, you know, because this is the part of the annual follow-up. Now, once we've made sure that every faculty has got the enough training, and also they have workshop for students, everybody is ready to get that kind of a training. Now, the next, the next step, and this is what we started back in 2022, I mean, a year ago, out of which we had this kind of a study that, I mean, I'll be very happy to, to send you the whole study, which was published in, in a journal. Uh, now, what we did actually, we formed a committee of experts in IT, and they visited uh, physically every university, and they had also, they were allowed to enter into every class, 
I mean, randomly to get some classes randomly from medical schools, from engineering, from humanities, from business schools, etc. And they got into, I mean, the, the, the online classes, either the, I mean, the, full, the fully online courses or the blended kind of things. To write the comments about them, they had spent about a week in every, in every university, they will spend a week or so to visit the campus and to listen to faculty, to listen to the students, to send them the surveys, to collect the data, and then we share the results and the findings with the university itself before, before we write the reports to the university to, make, to tell them about, about the shortcomings. Now, that was for last year. For this year, we started a month ago now visiting the schools again with the, I mean, with the, with the same comments that we sent them last year to make sure that they have you know, corrected them and they have made the recommendations to be, to be, to be, to be in reality. Shukran Jazeem, Professor. Dr. Wafa, one critical uh, comment. I think that the name of the Dr. Wafa is to be a part of it. It will be focused on the foreign students, and what about the other students? The foreign the graduates are the product. So the, the presentation actually talks about how you prepare them the whole period of time. If you want a critical thinker, you have the student for four years and you develop your learning experience within those four years so that at the outcome, that will be a critical thinker. Um, maybe we should have said yes, uh, preparing faculty and a student and the graduate will be the result of the student, but I agree. Yes, we have graduate attributes. The focus is on the graduate, but these right. attributes yes. are They're developed developed throughout the yes. uh, learning process. Yes. Then uh, another question for you. كيف يمكن دمج مفاهيم الذكاء الاصطناعي في المناهج التعليمية? Basically, uh, this will be, يعني بيتم الدمج عن طريقين. واحد عن طريق ال ال المنهاج الدراسي نفسه خلال المنهاج الدراسي استخدام الذكاء الاصطناعي في عملية التعلم من قبل الطالب سواء كان في على شكل مجموعات طلبة يعملون مع بعض أو كان عن طريق خلنا نقول بشكل فردي بيكون في عملية تعلم إلى ال ال الأدوات أو أدوات الذكاء الاصطناعي اللي موجودة um, um, it does not mean that it should be only for, uh, uh, let's say, uh, technical programs. No. AI uh, uh, text generators are mostly useful for actually liberal art courses. They can be utilized heavily by them. So uh, you don't need to know technology, the deep inside of the generation of the technology. But students need to know the limitation and the resources. Students need to know that at the end, the AI that produces a text is a statistical uh, device. It's a system, it's a mathematical system that guesses what will be the next word, what is the most probable word from all the big data that they have to be attached to the next. So that's why it is not a factual uh, device. It is basically a statistical device that guesses. The other thing it is very important is to teach the students why they, they need to learn, why they need to do this assignment, and why it is not in their best interest to utilize AI openly as much as they need to utilize it here and there. Uh, why do students cheat? Students cheat because they want the grade. We tell them learning is not important. Uh, sorry, we tell them a grade is not important. Learning is important. But we practice the other way. If they get a GPA less than two, two semesters, they are asked to leave the university. Mm -hmm. If they don't do well in high school, they cannot enter university. And if a university decides that they will enter <coughs> weak student, the accreditor will come to them and say, you have an open door policy for admission. So there is a system that indirectly <coughs> relies on the grade and the importance of the grade, and then we want the student to behave in a way that the grade is not important, the learning is important. So I think that is very important to instill in the, in the student too. Thank you, Nata. There's a, a request for you by Dr. Abdul Hamid. He says, thank you, 
for your nice presentation and slides. May we have Dr. Rafa's slides. Uh, and this is maybe uh, a question to Her Excellency Dr. Joha, if they can put the slides on the website, then the participants can uh, download them. Uh, we live in a world of uncertainty. Do you think that AI will stay? Yes, I, I think they will actually evolve. They will get smarter, so we need to get smarter so that they stay the tool that we use and they don't move to control us. And we don't have, uh, what was the movie that the AI were trying to eliminate us, Terminator? Yeah? We don't become like another edition of Thank Terminator. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, this uh, question is from Her Excellency Dr. Joha. كيف تعاملت هيئة الجودة الأردنية مع الآثار المترتبة عن إغلاق بعض الكليات الحكومية؟ كيف تم معالجة وضع الطلبة المسجلين فيها وأيضا مع الموظفين العاملين بهذه المؤسسات؟ It's not a matter of cancellation. It's a matter of stopping accepting insurance to these colleges. So, for example, if we have a College of Arts having seven departments, having 14 programs, we have a problem with three, four, five programs. We stop admitting students into these programs for some time until they make the amendments needed for each, either by having extra students in the car or lack of faculty members or faculty of lab. But after a while, after they make the corrections, okay, they write to us, we review them and see if they are capable of getting that again or not. Yes. Not closing, no. Partial closing, let's say. It seems that uh, lunch is ready, but there are many questions, but uh, I have been asked to uh, close this session. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rafa, Professor Bafer, and thank you all for attending this presentation. نذهب وإياكم الآن إلى استراحة الغداء والصلاة ونذكر بأن معالي الدكتورة رحمة بنت إبراهيم المحروقية وزيرة التعليم العالي والبحث العلمي والابتكار سترعى الجلسة الختامية من المؤتمر في تمام الرابع عصرا ونلتقي بحول الله تعالى في الواحدة وخمسة وأربعين دقيقة لبدء الجلسات الموازية شكرا لكم